Chapter 1 Little man, would you come on? You keep it up and you're going to make us late. My youngest brother paid no attention to me. Grasping more firmly his newspaper-wrapped notebook and his tin-can lunch of cornbread and oil sausages, he continued to concentrate on the dusty road. He lagged several feet behind my other brothers, Stacy, Christopher John, and me, attempting to keep the rusty Mississippi dust from swelling with each step and drifting back upon his shiny black shoes and the cuffs of his corduroy pants by lifting each foot high before setting it gently down again. Always meticulously neat, six-year-old little man never allowed dirt or tears or stains to mar anything he owned. Today was no exception. You keep it up and make us late for school. Mama's going to wear you out, I threatened, pulling with exasperation at the high collar of the Sunday dress Mama had made me wear for the first day of school, as if that event were something special. It seemed to me that showing up at school at all on a bright August, like October morning, made for running the cool forest trails and wading barefoot in the forest pond was concession enough. Sunday clothing was asking too much. Christopher, John, and Stacy were not too pleased about the clothing or school either. Only little man, just beginning his school career, found the prospects of both intriguing. Y'all go ahead and get dirty if y'all wanna, he replied without even looking up from his studied steps. Me, I'm gonna stay clean. I bet your mama's gonna clean you. You keep it up, I grumbled. Ah, Cassie, leave him be, Stacy admonished, frowning and kicking testily at the road. I ain't said nothing but... Stacy cut me a wicked look, and I grew silent. His disposition had been irritatingly sour lately. If I hadn't known the cause of it, I could have forgotten very easily that he was, at twelve, bigger than I, and that I had promised Mama to arrive at school looking clean and ladylike. Shoot, I mumbled, finally unable to restrain myself from further comment. It ain't my fault you got to be in Mama's class this year. Stacy's frown deepened, and he jammed his fists into his pockets, but said nothing. Christopher John, walking between Stacy and me, glanced uneasily at both of us, but did not interfere. A short, round boy of seven, he took little interest in troublesome things, preferring to remain on good terms with everyone, yet he always, yet he was always sensitive to others, and now, shifting the handle of his lunch can from his left hand to his right wrist and his smudged notebook from his left hand to his left armpit, he stuffed his free hands into his pockets and attempted to make his face as moody as Stacy's and as cranky as mine. But after a few moments he seemed to forget that he was supposed to be grouchy and began whistling cheerfully. There was little that could make Christopher John unhappy for very long, not even the thought of school. I tugged again at my collar and dragged my feet in the dust, allowing it to sift back into my socks and shoes like gritty red snow. I hated the dress and the shoes. There was little I could do in a dress, and as for shoes, they imprisoned freedom-loving feet accustomed to the feel of the warm earth. Cassie, stop that! Stacy snapped as the dust billowed in swirling clouds around my feet. I looked up sharply, sharply, ready to protest. Christopher John's whistling increased to a ruckus, nervous shrill. Grudgingly, I let the matter drop and trudged along in moody silence, my brothers growing as pensively and quiet as I. Before us, the narrow, sun-splotched road wound like a crazy red serpent, dividing the high forest bank of quiet old trees on the left from the cotton field, forested by giant green and purple stalks on the right. A barbed wire fence ran the length of the deep field, stretching eastward for over a quarter of a mile, until it met the sloping green pasture that signaled the end of our family's four hundred acres. An ancient oak tree on the slope, visible even now, was the official dividing mark between Logan Land and the beginning of a dense forest. Beyond the protective fencing of the forest was vast farming fields, worked by a multitude of sharecropping families, covered two-thirds of a ten-square-mile plantation. That was Harlan Granger Land. Once our land had been Granger Land, too but the Grangers had sold it during Reconstruction to a Yankee for tax money. In 1887, when the land was up for sale again, Grandpa had bought 200 acres of it, and in 1918, after the first 200 acres had been paid off, he had bought the, uh, another 200. It was good, rich land, much of it still virgin forest, and there was no debt on half of it, but there was a mortgage on the 200 acres bought in 1918, and there were taxes on the full 400, and for the past three years there had not been enough money from the cotton to pay for both and live on, too. That's why Papa had gone to work on the railroad. In 1930, the price of cotton dropped, and so, in the spring of 1931, Papa set out looking for work, going as far north as Memphis and as far south as the Delta country. country. He had gone west, too, into Louisiana. It was there he found work laying track for the railroad. He worked the remainder of the year away from us, not returning until the deep winter when the ground was cold and barren. The following spring, after planting was finished, he did the same. Now it was 1933, and Papa was again in Louisiana laying track. I asked him once why he had to go away, why the land was so important. He took my hand and said in a quiet way, Look out there, Cassie girl. 
all that belongs to you. You ain't never had to live on nobody's place but your own, and as long as I live and the family survives, you'll never have to. That's important. You may not understand that now, but one day you will. Then you'll see. I looked at Papa strangely when he said that, for I knew that all the land did not belong to me. Some of it belonged to Stacy, Christopher John, and Little Man, not to mention the part that belonged to Big Ma, Mama, and Uncle Hammer, Papa's older brother who lived in Chicago. But Papa never divided the land in his mind. It was simply Logan land. For he would work the long, hot summer pounding steel, Mama would teach and run the farm. Big Ma, in her sixties, would work like a woman of twenty in the fields and keep the house and the boys and I would wear threadbare clothing washed to dishwater color, but always the taxes and the mortgage would be paid. Papa said one day I would understand. I wondered. When the fields ended and the Granger, Granger forest fanned both sides of the road with long, overhanging branches, a tall, emaciated-looking boy popped suddenly from a forest trail and swung a thin arm around Stacy. It was T.J. Avery. His younger brother Claude emerged a moment later, smiling weakly as if it pained him to do so. Neither boy had on shoes, and their Sunday clothing, patched and worn, hung loosely upon their frail frames. The Avery family sharecropped on Granger land. Well, said T.J., jaunt jauntily swinging into step with Stacy, here we go again, starting another school year. Yeah, sighed Stacy. Aw, oh, man, don't look so down, T.J. said cheerfully. Your mama's one, really one great teacher. I should know. He certainly should. He had failed mama's class last year and was now returning for a second try. Shoot, you can say that, exclaimed Stacy. You don't have to spend all day in classroom with your mama. Look on the bright side, said T.J. Just think of the advantage you've got. You'll be learning all sorts of stuff for the rest of us, he smiled slyly. Like what's on all them tests. Stacy thrust T.J.'s arm from his shoulder. If that's what you think, you don't know mama. Ain't no need to get mad, T.J. replied undaunted. Just an idea. He was quiet for a moment and then announced, I betcha I could give y'all an earful about that burning last night. Burning? What burning? asked Stacy. Man, don't y'all know nothing? The berry's burning. I thought y'all's grandmother went over there last night to see about him. Of course we knew that Big Ma had gone to a sick house last night. She was good at medicines, and people often called her instead of a doctor when they were sick. But we didn't know anything about any burnings, and I certainly didn't know anything about berries either. What berries y'all talking about, Stacy? I asked. I don't know no berries. They live way over on the other side of Smellings Creek. They come up to church sometimes, said Stacy absently. He turned back to TJ. Mr. Lanier come by real late and got Big Ma. Said Mr. Barry was low sick and needed her to help him help nurse him, but he ain't said nothing about no burning. He's low sick all right, cause he got burnt near to death. Him and his two nephews. And you know who done it? Who? Stacy and I asked together. Well, since y'all don't seem to know nothing, said T.J. in his usual sickening way of nursing a tidbit of information to death, maybe I ought not to tell y'all. It might hurt y'all's little ears. Ah, oh, boy, I said. Don't start with that mess again. I didn't like T.J. very much, and his stalling around didn't help. Come on, T.J. said Stacy. Out with it. Well, T.J. murmured, then grew silent, as if considering whether or not he should talk. We reached the first two of crossroads and turned north. Another mile, and we would approach the second crossroads and turn east again. Finally, T.J. said, Okay, see, them burnings, them berries burning wasn't no accident. Some white men took a match to him. You, you mean just lit him up like a piece of wood? stammered Christopher John, his eyes growing big with disbelief. But why? asked Daisy. T.J. shrugged. Don't know why. Just know they done it, that's all. How you know? I questioned suspiciously. He smiled smugly. Because your mama come down on her way to school and talked to my mama about it. She did? Yeah, and you should have seen the way she looked when she come out of that house. How'd she look? inquired little man, interested enough to glance up from the road for the first time. T.J. looked around grimly and whispered, Like death. He waited a moment for his words to be appropriately shocking, but the effect was spoiled by little man, who asked lightly, What does death look like? T.J. turned in annoyance. Don't he know nothing? Well, what does it look like, little man demanded now, to know. He didn't like T.J. either. Like my grandfather looked just before they buried him, T.J. described all knowingly. Oh, replied little man, losing interest and concentrating on the road again. I tell you, Stacy man, said T.J. morosely, shaking his head, sometimes I just don't know about that family of yours. Stacy pulled back, considering whether or not T.J.'s words were offensive. But T.J. immediately erased the question by continuing... Am amably. Don't get me wrong, Stacy. Some real swell kids, but that Cassie bout got me whipped this morning. Good, I said. Now how'd she do that? Stacy laughed. You wouldn't be laughing if it happened to you. She was up and told your mama about me going up to that Wallace store dancing room, and Ms. Logan told mama. He eyed me disdainfully, then went on. But don't worry, I got out of it, though. When mama asked me about it, I just said old Claude was always sneaking up there to get some of that free candy Mr. Caleb gives out. 
and I had to go get him, because I knowed good and well she didn't want us up there. Boy, did he get it, T.J. laughed. Mom about wore him out. I stared quiet at Claude. You let him do that? I exclaimed. But Claude only smiled in that sickly way of his, and I knew that he had. He was more afraid of T.J. than of his mother. Again, little man glanced up, and I could see his dislike for T.J. growing. Friendly Christopher John glared at T.J., and putting his short arm around Claude's shoulder said, Come on, Claude, let's go on ahead. Then he and Claude hurried up the road, away from T.J. Stacy, who generally overlooked T.J.'s underhanded stunts, shook his head. That was dirty. Well, what'd you expect me to do? I couldn't let her think I was going up there, because I'd like to. Could I? She'd have killed me. And good riddance, I thought, promising myself that if he ever pulled anything like that on me, I'd knock his block off. We were nearing the second crossroads, where deep gullies lined both sides of the road, and the dense forest crept to the very edge of the high, jagged clay-walled banks. Suddenly, Stacy turned. Quick, he cried, off the road! Without another word, all of us but little man scrambled up the steep right bank into the forest. Get up here, man, Stacy ordered. But little man only gazed at the ragged red bank sparsely covered with scraggly brown briars and kept on walking. Come on, do as I say. But I'll get my clothes dirty, protested little man. You're going to get them a whole lot dirtier you stay down there. Look. Little man turned around and watched saucer-eyed as the bus bore down on him, spewing clouds of red dust like a huge yellow dragon breathing fire. Little man handed toward the bank, but it was too steep. He ran frantically along the road, looking for a foothold, and finding one, hopped onto the bank, but not before the bus had sped past, enveloping him in a scarlet haze while laughing white faces pressed against the bus windows. Little man shook a threatening fist into the thick air, then looked dismayed, dismally down at himself. Well, old little man, done got his Sunday clothes dirty, T.J. laughed as we jumped down from the bank. Angry tears welled in little man's eyes, but he quickly brushed them away before T.J. could see them. Ah, shut up, T.J., Stacy snapped. Yeah, shut up, T.J., I echoed. Come on, man, Stacy said. The next time, do as I tell ya. Little man hopped down from the bank. How's comes they did that, Stacy, huh? He asked, dusting himself off. How's come they didn't even stop for us? Because they like to see us run, and it ain't our bus, Stacy said, balled his fists and jamming them tightly into his pockets. Well, where's our bus? demanded little man. We ain't got one. Well, why not? Ask Mama, Stacy replied, as a towhead boy, barefoot and pale, came running down a forest path toward us. The boy quickly caught up and fell in stride with Stacy and TJ. Hey, Stacy, he said shyly. Hey, Jeremy, Stacy said. There was an awkward silence. Y'all just starting school today? Yeah, replied Stacy. I wish ours was just starting, sighed Jeremy. Ours been going on since the end of August. Jeremy's eyes were a white-washed blue, and they seemed to weep when he spoke. Yeah, said Stacy. Jeremy kicked the dust briskly and looked toward the north. He was a strange boy. Ever since I'd begun school, he had walked with us as far as the crossroads in the morning and met us there in the afternoon. He was often ridiculed by the other children at his school, and had shown up more than once with wide red welts on his arms, which Lily and Jean, his older sister, had revealed with satisfaction, were the result of associating with us. Still, Jeremy continued to meet us. When we reached the crossroads, three more children and a girl of twelve or thirteen, and two boys, all still looking very much like Jeremy, rushed past. That girl was Lily and Jean. "'Jeremy, come on!' she said without a backwards glance, and Jeremy, smiling sheepishly, waved a timid goodbye and slowly followed her. We stood in the crossing gazing we stood at the crossing gazing after them. Jeremy looked back once, but then Lily and Jean sh- yelled, yelled shrilly at him, and he did not look back. They were heading for the Jefferson Davis County School, a long white wooden building looming in the distance. Behind the building was a wide sports field around which were scattered rows of tiered gray looking benches. In front of it were two yellow buses, our own tormentor, and one that brought students from the other direction, and loitering students awaiting the knell of the morning bell. In the very center of the expansive front lawn, waving red, white, and blue, with the emblem of the Confederacy emblazoned in its upper left-hand corner, was the Mississippi flag. Directly below it was the American flag. As Jeremy and his sisters and brothers hurried towards those transposed flags, we turned eastward toward our own school.